week of the UMN Conservation Sciences Seminar Series. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. John Marsloff. Lucky to have him here today. Um, my name is Jack Raby. I'm a first year master student working with Dave Meach on predator prey dynamics in Yellowstone. Uh, before we get started, uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end for questions. Uh, so please feel free to put those in the chat or we encourage you if you're not shy to uh, speak up at the end um, and ask your questions directly. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Marsloff. He is the James W. Ridgway Professor of Wildlife Science at the University of Washington. His graduate work at Northern Arizona University and his initial postdoctoral work at University of Vermont focused on the social behavior and ecology of jays and ravens. He continues this theme investigating the intriguing behavior of crows, ravens, and jays. His current research focuses on the interactions of ravens and wolves in Yellowstone. He teaches ornithology, governance, and conservation of rare species, field research in Yellowstone, and natural and cultural history of Costa Rica. Professor Marsloff has written five books and edited several others. His Welcome to Suburbia in 2014 discovers that moderately settled lands host a splendid array of biological diversity and suggests ways in which people can steward these riches to benefit birds and themselves. His most recent, recent work, in Search of Meadowlarks connects our agriculture and diets to the conservation of birds and other wildlife. Dr. Marsloff has mentored over 40 graduate students and authored over 140 scientific papers on various aspects of bird behavior and wildlife management. He is a member of the US Fish and Wildlife Services recovery team for the critically endangered Mariana Crow, a former member of the Washington Biodiversity Council, a fellow of the American Ornithologist Union and a National Geographic Explorer. With that, uh, Dr. Marzoff, please take uh, take it away. The screen is yours. Thanks a lot, Jack, and thanks for inviting me to uh, to share this work with you all today. Uh, it's really uh, at its first stages, so you will get a lot of descriptive and preliminary information. But I hope it stimulates some questions and ideas and suggestions uh, for us moving forward with this work as well. You guys know this system well up there, and I'm, I'm curious for your insights into to ours as well. But I will deal with the influence of people and wolves and other carnivores uh, on ravens. They're, they're scavengers, as many of you know. And if I can get my screen to move. Their, their numbers have been increasing dramatically over at least the, the Western US, if, if not many other parts of the world. I really see these uh, animals as, as I say here, supreme adapters and one of the most successful and influential species on earth. They've influenced not only uh, the other organisms they interact with in a natural setting, but also in the human setting have influenced our culture and language and beliefs for millennia. So today I wanna to touch a bit on their biology uh, and then uh, really explore our ongoing work uh, in Yellowstone. We've completed a first year of this work and, um, and look at how they're exploiting a variety of resources there. And then in with just a little bit on concerns for their effects on other uh, prey that they, they take. And that's exemplified by this graph, which shows this exponential increase in Montana. You can make the same graph for the Western US or you pick your state. Uh, and it's going to look the same. And I want to understand that and I want to think about how we might uh, affect that if we're concerned about species that these animals prey upon. So first off, a little bit of the biology. Uh, ravens uh, form lifelong pair bonds. They're monogamous pair bonds. This is a pair of birds in the Lamar preening, which is a common activity uh, of these animals when they, they form these um, tight uh, relationships. And this, this pair is really the central aspect of their social organization. I think it's probably every raven's um, goal to become a mated pair and defend a territory that it has an exclusive right to at least some of the resources on that. Um, but that's not the only aspect of their social structure. They're also um, uh, before they attain uh, a mate, they live in um, groups that move in a, in a 
in a very fluid fashion across the landscape, what we call vagrant non-breeders. They're not flocks per se, but they're aggregations at uh, rich food sources. This is a group that Bern Heinrich and I were studying in Maine, uh, in this case, in a, in a captive situation, uh, feeding upon a frozen uh, raccoon. <laughs> But um, the, the social interactions here are intense. The dominance hierarchy is very important uh, to how these animals organize their movements and their um, access to foods. And that affects a bit uh, how they exploit uh, ephemeral foods. And, and this sort of scenario that, that Bernd and I uh, developed was uh, one that, that works well in a forested situation like you would have in Minnesota when there were not probably uh, a lot of carnivores providing resources on a more um, uh, regular basis. But instead in the woods of Maine in the, in the 1990s, most of the large animals that were provided by poor ravens were incidental. Uh, maybe they were winter kill or um, other accidents that befell these animals such as a moose. And, and what happens there initially is that whatever territorial pair happens to have that dead animal in their territory, they feed upon it. And they do that uh, exclusively and quietly, and they try to keep that uh, great bonanza to themselves. But eventually, some of these vagrants, uh, shown here by a tag bird just flying over, discover this food as well. They try to feed with the adults, and they're harassed, they're attacked. And uh, what happens is these young birds beg uh, and, and call in a hunger uh, state around this food. And that calling attracts others in, usually not very many and usually not enough to overpower the, the defense done by this territorial. Uh, I get access, occasionally getting a little early change when some of these birds go back to their communal roosts where they sleep at night with uh, about a hundred other individuals. And the next morning, as those individuals head, uh, head to the uh, food, others follow them. And that results in a large increase in the number of ravens at a food source shortly uh, after one of those evening events. But that's not maybe the case where we have carnivores on the landscape, large carnivores like wolves uh, that are making kills every few days that these birds also can exploit. But as you see here in this picture from Yellowstone that uh, Aaron Stoller took from, um, from the wolf team, these kills are not available for very long. This was killed in the morning, uh, this, this calf elk, and it was immediately fed upon by a golden eagle standing right in the middle there and many ravens around the edge of that uh, kill. So while there's food provided often, uh, in this carnivore system, it's, it's pretty short lived. And it might not pay, for example, for any of these birds to go back to a roost and try to attract others in because the, the food won't even be there the next day. So information exchange, this uh, sharing of information as incidentally as it may be at the roost may not occur when we have um, natural carnivores on the landscape, or at least it may not be as important. And it's also probably not as important when there are many anthropogenic resources. So again, in, in our study area, in the Yellowstone area, ravens have access not only to wolf kills, but to garbage dumps and transfer stations like shown on the left. And one of their favorite food items is the fat that floats up around um, water treatment plants. And especially as ice forms, birds are able to It's not as sexy as eating wolf kills, but hey, it, it pays the bills for these birds for sure. So what about their uh, interaction? Uh, you know, since some of this was developed uh, in, in your part of the world, but there have been speculations, uh, some quotes here from, from Lopez that suggests that ravens may lead wolves to prey. They certainly uh, feed on their kills um, they play maybe with, uh, with wolves and maybe enjoy that interaction. And um, people uh, value this interaction and value this ability of uh, wolves and ravens 
to interact and uh, provide for one another. More scientific observations from, uh, from, from David Meech and Dan Stoller and others shown here suggest that indeed uh, ravens and wolves have a close association. They may be completely dependent ravens on wolves for, for their food in places like Isle Royale. Um, and they, they seem to not only um, follow wolves, but they may actually draw the attention of wolves uh, to a, a vulnerable prey through local enhancement. That is just the activity around a wounded animal or a, an animal that's acting strange um, could, could attract the attention of wolves. Certainly, uh, I think that's, that seems likely to be with, with individual wolves, maybe that are, um, that are scavenging more than, than a pack hunting. But nonetheless, that's the background we had uh, going into this study. And some of the particulars uh, from, from Stoller's work in particular uh, show that uh, here that ravens, what Dan did is he watched basically uh, wolves doing a variety of things, coyotes doing a variety of things, and landscape elk. Uh, and what he noted was that indeed, um, when ravens, uh, when wolves are on the landscape, basically ravens are with them. All their activities combine 87% of the ravens around those wolves and when there was a kill it was it was exclusive 100 percent of the time and that's very different than coyotes uh, ravens don't seem to pay nearly as much attention to coyotes as they do wolves and we know that soon as a kill is made uh, and that's shown best in this graph over here uh, that shortly thereafter uh, immediately at the time of kill there are a few ravens around and through the first hour the number of ravens increases dramatically so this is very different than what uh, we saw in the main woods where it might take days where you'd have a few individuals around trying to get access to that food and then a large increase overnight. So this really suggests local enhancement during the day, the activity, the sight of, of the wolves and the ravens and other things on the landscape, other scavengers might attract uh, ravens in. So that was kind of the starting point for the research that we're conducting now. Uh, and what we're trying to understand now through um, tagging and monitoring uh, through GPS collars, the movements of ravens and simultaneously the movements and activities of wolves and cougars and other things that, that uh, Jack has been studying on the landscape. Uh, we're trying how by surveys that right, the activity of wolves and the weather. Uh, and then we also want to understand the mechanisms by which they exploit wolves. Is it more this enhancement, local observation, or is it um, some sort of uh, attraction from a communal roost? So I keep getting a, a signal that says my internet is unstable. Hope, hopefully it's not um, not a problem for you guys. Just scream if it is. All right, so uh, I thought you'd first be interested in how we catch our birds. So here's a little video that shows basically our, our trapping technique. We use a net launcher and that's hidden over here on the, the left side of the ravens now. This is a bit of food they're feeding on that wolves had scavenged. And uh, we shoot a net over these birds. In this case, we were lucky and caught a couple. Uh, and we've caught um, over 70 birds now, and we've um, put GSM tags shown here, solar powered backpacks on uh, 63 birds, and by their communication with cell tower, as well as uh, through direct downloads, we're able to monitor the movements of these animals. And I can tell you, we got this work done just before lockdown with the pandemic, and I've never been so happy to have automatic uh, data logging come in as during that time, it's been a godsend to be able to monitor these birds uh, even without having to be there, although we're, we try to observe as much as we can. So my collaborators, the prime collaborator is Matias Loretto. He's a postdoc, now a 
a professor at the Technical University in Munich, but he was with uh, um, Martin uh, Wachelski and others in uh, Germany looking at uh, telemetry and spatial uh, movements. And, and he's a Raven researcher from long uh, back as well. And he and I captured the birds and have been monitoring them. And he's really taking the lead on a lot of the analysis that will be forthcoming. Of course, Doug Smith and Dan Staler are integral uh, collaborators on the, on the carnivore projects there. And Lauren Walker is a, a bird biologist there that's also an integral um, collaborator, as is Jack and Connor and Nikki and all the other members of the wolf and cougar teams on the ground there that really uh, help out a lot in directing us to the places to see our interactions we're interested in. So let's talk a bit about what we know about how these birds are interacting with wolves uh, from, this, from this first use. Certainly, uh, ravens are right there when wolves make a kill. And fortunately, in Yellowstone, we're able to see a lot of that. Uh, looking at our tag birds, uh, we can just see here the frequency with which tag birds are at the wolf kills that we knew about on the ground. There were 204 wolf kills identified in 20 uh, and, and uh, visited by at least one of our tag birds. And there was a few kills, two of them that had a dozen of our tag birds at them. Uh, and um, most of the kills though just had one of our birds or, or a, maybe a, a pair of the birds. So they use them and our tag birds are getting some look, but there's a lot that's, that's going on out there that we're not seeing from the tag birds because certainly all these kills had ravens at them, just not ours. And of the, uh, in the number of wolf kills that a particular uh, raven might visit during this year, um, Basically, 30% of our tag birds didn't visit any wolf kills that, that we were aware of. And about a quarter, 22% of our birds visited multiple numbers of kills. So we seem to have uh, some birds that are somewhat specializing or at least actively using um, these resources, others that really aren't at all, and, and some that are doing it uh, quite incidentally. And in terms of the age composition of the ravens that do these behaviors, um, the ones that really seem to spend a lot of time uh, with these kills, and this is undoubtedly reflective of our monitor, um, typically were these, these adults here are birds that are mated and territory owners within the Lamar or the uh, other aspects of the Northern range where we know most about wolves and the most birds tagged there. Um, we have an interesting group of subadults. Uh, these are part of that non-vagrant wandering group that I mentioned early, and it seems like especially uh, male subadults, so two to three-year-old birds, um, are also quite heavily invested in, in uh, following and utilizing wolf kills. In contrast, juveniles were not. Uh, we had none of our juveniles doing that on a regular basis and uh, only a few that did it on a um, occasional basis. So it really seems like maybe um, there, there are two aspects of the raven population that really focus on wolves. If you're a territory owner and, and wolves are around you, you definitely know about them and you use those kills. And if you're a non-breeder but fairly dominant, so these sub-adults are probably relatively dominant in the non-breeding group, then it pays to go in and utilize wolf kills as well because you can get access. If there are 60 ravens at a wolf kill and you're a juvenile of the year, a, sub a subordinate individual, you're not going to get much food even if you go there. So it may pay you to do other things. And in fact, I think they primarily um, utilize a lot of anthropogenic resources. So here's the dynamic that we see. Uh, I'll show you two different kills and, and the timeline at which ravens exploited them. And this tells us about uh, the mechanisms with which they uh, find and, and utilize these kills. So what, what you see here is just the number of ravens, and that's also the number in the little circles, as a function of time across four days. And in this case, I was lucky enough to watch the wolves hunting, and there was one raven with these hunting wolves. Um, and they uh, made a kill around noon that day, and there were four ravens at the time of the kill. They weren't able to 
speed, but they were right there associated with the kill. As that day progressed, the number of ravens increased up to 15. Uh, about an hour or two later after the kill was made, it dropped back down, it increased a bit at night. These increases that you see and decreases down to zero as we go along uh, the first few days are when wolves come in and push all the ravens out or a coyote or a eagle comes in and pushes them out. So there's a lot of up and back, back and forth, a lot of activity around the kill as the carnivores are interacting with it and the ravens are trying to get access. The next morning, uh, there was a, a few birds around, uh, a few more, 10 uh, first thing at light, and that increased up to 23. So there was a gain overnight uh, from the 15 we left to 23. And then uh, from that point on, all of the up and down basically during this second day is, is, due to, um, is, is due to basically the movements of the carnivores at those. Sorry. Um, the numbers of ravens gradually decreases over the next couple of days as wolves leave that kill. There just isn't any food left. You know, they, this is an elk. Uh, it lasted a couple of days with this, the Junction Butte pack that was eating it, a large pack of wolves. And uh, the ravens basically had no food. But it, at least at this buildup, and I just quantified this a bit here, um, over the, the time frame at which uh, we look from during the day versus over and of the changes were positive during the day. That is, there was an increased number of birds attracted as the day were on, and there were losses typically overnight, especially as food dwindled, that we'd have a high at uh, 33, say on the end of day two, but at the start of day three, or yeah, we were only at, at 10 birds in the morning. So big drop in the, those numbers, not an increase from day from night, from night to day, as we would expect if roosts were playing a large role here. Another example of this is, is another more typical situation where a kill might be made at night. So ravens weren't there, they're roosting uh, at night. And uh, the next morning they find this kill immediately. There's one bird there at dawn, quickly builds up to a few individuals and then a large increase up to 30 or so. Uh, a little bit later uh, over the next few hours. So again, this accumulation during the day attracts the activity at the kill rather than utilization of the roost to attract others in as we saw in other uh, studies. And again, that's just shown with numbers uh, that we lose birds uh, from one day to the next morning and we end during the day. So we can look at this spatially with the uh, GPS data now. And, and these are the sorts of analyses we're just starting to formalize. But this is a neat setup. This was that uh, last kill I just showed you, a uh, wolf kill here of an elk. And we had at that time four birds uh, in the area. There was a non-breeder over here in the Bozeman area. There was another non-breeder up here by Billings. And uh, there were two territorial birds that uh, were in the valley all of these four birds would eventually use this kill. So initially uh, on day one at 7.30 and then at 11 in the morning, the two territorial birds, the, the red bird here and the purple bird here, each of these dots are just the locations of these birds uh, throughout this day. Uh, and these animals were at the wolf kill um, during that first day, the first morning of that day when the numbers built up to about 30 individuals that I just showed you. Neither of those non-breeders is in at this point. They're both male non-breeders. So the next day on day two, uh, one of the non-breeders, the one that was up here living comfortably at the dump outside of Bozeman, decides for some reason to travel 140 miles and, and join this wolf kill. Uh, and, and it is in there and it, it feeds at that kill. How it got the information for that trek, I have no idea. But on the fourth day, the other non-breeder that joins did the same thing. So from 100 miles away, this bird beelines it in uh, on the fourth day and joins the, the fray. And so um, these birds that are now utilizing this kill include the two territorial birds, the red and purple, uh, that dominate this carcass, uh, and um, two different territories, I should say. And then uh, these two non-breeders that have come in, plus there's you know 20 or 30 other ravens there. 
So there's a, a large signal of information. They're getting the same information, I think mostly during the day uh, and maybe occasionally from the roost. So here's the roost that was happening at this same time. Again, here's our kill. Here's the communal roost. And at this roost, we knew there were three non-breeders at it uh, during the time this kill was being um, utilized. The two, non, the two uh, territorial birds, again, the red and the purple, they didn't join that communal roost. They roosted probably with their mate on their territory as they typically do. But even of those three non-breeders in the roost, several of them went right back to the gardener and to um, the, the anthropogenic resources in the developed area outside the park, whereas only one of them came into that wolf kill. Now, now maybe others that were not tagged were in that roost and came in as well. But again, most of the information that is alerting other ravens to this kill is occurring during the day, not so much at night. Well, what about dens? We're just starting to look at whether these animals also uh, key in on dens. That's been reported. Dan Stoller observed it uh, out in Yellowstone. And what we've seen of our tag birds is that uh, there were 13 uh, individuals that indeed spent some time around dens in 2020 uh, that were active. And none of those were juveniles. So again, the most the it seems like this strategy of a non-breeder, especially a more dominant non-breeder, uh, second year males in this case, were the ones that uh, visited dens most reliably and most frequently. And, and in terms of the number of our birds at a given den, we had uh, a couple of dens that had up to four of our tag birds at them. So they definitely spend some time there and around there scavenging, um, but it's, it's not a, um, a super frequent event, but one we wanna look at in more detail. Again, just the spatial aspects of this will show, I think, again, that it's not the prime focus of these animals. Here's a den site. Here were three birds that were associated with it during the denning period, a couple of male non-breeders and a, a female, a territorial female that had uh, failed at breeding. And there's some association there, but look at these other large concentrations of ravens at different parts of the environment that obviously there's something uh, much more um, rich and, and suitable for the birds there. Here's another example of another pack and more in the interior of the park and more concentration around this particular den site that was used in two years. But there are also situations like this where there are dens on the landscape and there are ravens all around and they don't pay any attention to them. And same thing over here. A lot of, act, lot of ability or opportunity to utilize the dens, but our birds aren't. Well, I think a lot of the data that we're seeing really shows the variety of resources available to the ravens in this landscape, even with carnivores. Um, you know, they, they occasionally pay attention to those resources. They utilize them, especially if they're dominant, uh, the birds. They utilize those resources provided by carnivores, but they're doing a lot of other things. This just shows a breakdown of the diversity of these ravens foraging uh, uh, locations in the autumn and in the um, uh, spring and summer, basically here. And, and what we see is that hunter gut piles are extremely important for these birds, especially in, in the fall. Uh, about a quarter of all the locations of our birds from everywhere in the park uh, and outside the park were associated with gut piles from hunters outside of the park. And I'll show you some examples of that. They use agriculture outside of the park, garbage dumps outside of the park, compost facilities outside of the park, water treatment facilities outside of the park, road kills outside of the park, and dispersed uh, feeding opportunities in towns and villages and cities outside the park. They beg within the park uh, at recreational sites and they utilize natural foods. About 13% of the observations in the um, fall and winter were at natural foods, that's primarily wolf kills or cougar kills or um, natural deaths, winter kills. And about 60% in the summer, but these are rarely kills by carnivores. These are much more uh, likely insect hatches. We've seen them catching salmon flies along the river 
when uh, the salmon fly hatches out, they're flipping bison patties for uh, grubs and, and worms. And they are probably also utilizing high elevation uh, hibernacula of beetles and moths. We've seen them at these elevations. And we don't know for sure that's what they're doing, but that's on the list. So let me show you a few of these individual strategies then of how they're utilizing these different resources. So if you're a breeding uh, raven, you have constraints during the breeding season. You've got these guys to take care of and they're uh, demanding of food. They, the adults are close by and gathering these foods, bringing them into the young and, and stuffing them to, to keep them quiet uh, frequently. So they've, in terms of what they can, what they can actually do. And, and that's reflected in the space use. So this, this uh, nest here is down by Mud Volcano. For those of you who know the park, uh, it's well down in the Hayden Valley, the end of the Hayden Valley and um, interior of the park. And during the breeding season, May to August, this male uh, rarely went outside of a few, um, may, maybe 10, five to 10 kilometers uh, from the nest. That changes uh, rapidly though, as these young mature, here's his nest in, in a dense, stand of lodgepole. Three fledglings were produced by this uh, male and his mate uh, that particular year. And as the, um, as the breeding season starts to come to an end and the young become independent, which they do after about a month uh, with their parents, this male starts expanding his movements. And th those are the blue dots relative to the earlier pink dots that you just saw. And if we zoom out so we can get a full appreciation of this, Here's his nest down here. And this bird is regularly commuting back and forth up to 50 to 60 kilometers one way every day to exploit resources up here in the Northwest. His travels expand tenfold during this time from uh, a range of 5.6 miles across the, the farthest part of its uh, range to 57. So why go up there? What are the resources that it's getting? Well, first off, they're getting gut piles. This is a, a prime hunting area of both of these circles. And this bird's spending a lot of time up there foraging on gut piles left by elk hunters. And he's also hitting dumpsters. So he's working the, the facilities outside of Gardner and even further up the Paradise Valley. And that's just shown the anthropogenic resources that this animal's using uh, here. Um, in the, the early part of the year, the, the winter, October to March, uh, regularly going from its territory on these daily commutes back and forth uh, outside of the park. The boundary of the park <clears throat> is shown in gray. Less so during the breeding season, but still making some forays out uh, to the outside of the park, but concentrating a lot of activity as it has to um, around the nest. So non-breeders take this to an extreme. They don't have the constraint of having in a nest to deal with. So they look at a couple of to quantify home range. A territorial bird, the you know the, just the uh, minimum convex polygon is somewhere around 3,500 uh, square kilometers. It's 27,000 for non-breeders. And if you if you do a more sophisticated uh, projection that takes into account movement uh, and concentration of use, the dynamic Brownian bridge model, somewhere around 500 square kilometers for uh, territorial birds and 2,700 for non-breeders. So orders of magnitude greater movements of non-breeders. And one of the most extreme ones I just show you here, uh, this was the bird we tagged in the park. And it, it started moving north out of the park, traveled all through uh, Montana, uh, across the divide and back a couple of times, eventually ended up in, in Canada and has remained up here in the Alberta area pretty consistently now, although it occasionally comes back and forth. Somehow they can get across the border even with the restrictions in place, uh, no problem. And the, the coloration here shows an interesting thing about this bird. And, and I think it's pretty typical for these non-breeders. Again, using a variety of anthropogenic resources, garbage down by uh, Gardner, agricultural areas in Eastern Montana, 
and using power lines to roost on. All the red dots here are, this is our only bird that roosts on power lines, but it did so in Montana and is also doing so in Canada. And the aggregations of ravens at power lines are huge, thousands of birds. And so this animal learns about information from many individuals, can follow them, perhaps eventually form a pair bond with one of them uh, during this several years likely of, of vagrant life. So here's a non-breeder. We thought he was a breeder, and I just will show you his expansion. Um, this bird is, was called Bernie by the construction crew where we caught him. He regularly worked cars that were stopped for construction in the park. And uh, after we uh, tagged him, he basically stayed for the next few days very close around where we caught him, and we thought he was territorial there. During the uh, hunting season, he, he immediately started doing that same trajectory that we saw the prior bird uh, do, going up to exploit hunters outside of Gardner. He expanded that, the yellow now in the winter, but still in the same general area. The uh, coronavirus shutdown of human activity in the park and a lot of activity outside the park, the red uh, coloration here was his basic um, range. During that next month, during the COVID shutdown, uh, he, he expanded his range considerably, the pink area here. And we were curious, the, he was one of the most extreme responses to that that we saw. A lot of our birds didn't really adjust things much at all to that change in resource base. But then he started wandering widely, going south. Uh, we thought maybe he was a breeder down here. We could confirm no, no breeding activities, acting much more like a non-breeder. And then going back the next year in purple, he's heading back his second winter with us. He's, he's again hunting with uh, uh, elk hunters. And eventually the light blue is where his action, his action was at the end of the year. Uh, and he's starting, it seems to establish a territory somewhere down here around the Tetons. That bird's uh, year basically encompassed 6,500 square miles. And he utilized much of the area within that area as well. The, I, I give you this example just to illustrate the geographic scale at which these animals know the land and know the resources within the land, both natural and anthropogenic. And they use them uh, however they need. Some of them have, have more confined strategies. And there are a couple of very seasoned begging birds uh, in the park. And um, this, this bird uh, was approaching this, this guy in the car, looking at him, the guy eventually tossed him a, a bit of a sandwich. And it's a strategy that I've seen many of our territorial, this is an adult territorial bird that they utilize if they have a picnic area or a stopping area near them. The one that really takes us to the extreme is a non-breeder and um, Stevie, as the local people call this bird, uh, was unknown to me till I captured it. I had no idea this bird had a history with the people of Cook City, Montana, but, but she does. They, they thought he was a male, but, but he's a she. So when I caught Stevie, we, we tagged her, let her go. And um, you know I expected to see her moving uh, over great distances because of her non-breeding status. But I soon uh, was uh, found out that the people of Cook City were quite upset <laughs> to see their favorite bird with an with antenna coming out of its back, as you can see here, and leg bands. And they wondered what the heck was going on. So fortunately, I heard about it, went up and talked with them. And I met this woman in particular who, uh, who works at a nearby bar. And basically, Stevie comes to her house every day and looks for food. And... She calls to him. You can see the woman inside uh, interacting with this bird. There's some food, kind of not a high preferred item outside there. And she's got some roast beef inside. She, she takes roast beef home every Wednesday from the bar where she works for this bird. He's, she has a pretty good life, the, the raven. And she's been trained by this woman to ring this bell outside of her window to get food because they were afraid that Stevie was gonna break their window. She would pound on it so hard to get their attention uh, before they put the bell out there. So you can see her, she sees the food, Stevie rings the bell, and then the woman's gonna come out and, and feed her. But a pretty good strategy. 
when we look at Stevie's movements, here's Cook City where, where that activity was occurring. And um, it's concentrated there. It's still, she occasionally takes big uh, circuits down to um, Cody, Wyoming or up by Bozeman. But for the most part, she concentrates her activity unlike most non-breeders around these people. And I noticed not only the concentration you see here in, in Cook City, but I noticed some other ones. There was a strong concentration here by this lake in the wilderness, really in the bear tubes. And I wondered what in the heck she was doing up there. And about that time, I got an email from a lawyer who said that a friend of his has a cabin up in the wilderness where uh, there's a raven that hangs out with him. And he wondered if, if we knew anything about that bird. And, and here's the cabin that was right under that concentration of points. And I figured it was some hermit that lived up there and, and had an interesting relationship with, with Steve that I should go and check. So, so we hiked into this uh, cabin here uh, in the about four miles into the, um, into the wilderness. And, and we met uh, Lowell Hansen. Uh, who has a strong interaction again. Here's Steve again, working a different person. Steve's got a whole bunch of people that, uh, that she works. And Lowell turns out to have been the former uh, Lieutenant Governor of South Dakota. So there's some interesting people that I've met through, uh, through my experience with this bird. And she continues to amaze me at how big of a network of people she has to interact with and, and works them all for whatever they, they would do anything for this bird. Uh, both of these these folks for sure. Well, they're not all beggars. Some are thieves. Uh, this is a bird from the Grand Canyon. You will notice this is not in Yellowstone, but um, it's an interesting reason why this doesn't occur as much in Yellowstone. It did. These birds will rip into packs. They will undo Velcro. They will unzip things. They will rifle through your belongings looking for food. So be careful what you leave around uh, when ravens are in the area. This one fortunately didn't take any credit cards or eyeglasses, but also didn't find what it was looking for. So um, in Yellowstone, however, there were reports around Old Faithful in the winter of snowmobilers having their uh, snowmobile satchels robbed by ravens. And I was curious to see that. So we have a couple of birds tagged. There's an aerial view of, of Old Faithful. Here's a distribution of points of two of our territorial birds there. You can see they, they maintain kind of a nice uh, segregation of their uh, territories. They exploit different areas. One tends to go to Idaho and the other one to West Yellowstone, Montana, uh, when they don't uh, stay on their territories. And when they are there, they, um, they work the tourists that are there to steal food from them. Um, even though there are uh, animal proof containers, some food is dropped for these birds. But their interaction with snowmobiles has been curtailed. And this is an example of what I've referred to in the past as cultural coevolution between an, an, a social animal and humans. And as the ravens were stealing uh, from the what used to be backpacks and Velcroed um, back uh, containers on the snowmobiles, um, the snowmobile industry changed. <laughs> And the snowmobiles that are used in the park now all have these um, hard shelled containers in the back and they lock. And at least for now, the Ravens haven't figured out how to unlock them, but it's only a matter of time before they get the keys and they're gonna be in there, I'm sure. Right now they're just ticked off and they're ripping holes in the seats. This is what this area is. And they are, um, they're frustrated with not getting into those. So we, we don't know what the next move of humans or ravens will be in this coevolutionary process. But right now, the arms race is being won by people that have made their food and other items less available to the ravens. So let me just end with, again, a consideration of this graph. And then I'm, I'm glad to uh, discuss with you anything that you, you find interesting. This increase in ravens across the Western US puts them at odds with other conservation efforts for endangered species, such as snowy plovers, greater sage grouse or desert tortoise. And uh, the campaign that the basic strategy in response to this has been, um, well, some protection of nests of, of these animals, some uh, concerns about increasing habitat and complexity of habitat. So these animals are less able to find um, the young eggs, chicks, or baby tortoises that they eat. But mostly, 
it's been to kill uh, the ravens. And here's a graph of the number of ravens killed in the, in the US annually by the wildlife services. And my, I, I, we've been working on this issue, trying to understand it better and trying to offer other solutions, non-lethal solutions, or actually really just more sustainable solutions. There will be ravens killed by controlling subsidies, which is what I think we should do. And I hope what the information you've seen from Yellowstone suggests is very important in how these birds, especially younger ones, uh, but even those territorial birds that fly 50 or 60 miles one way each day to exploit human resources, we could think about how to make those less available, how to control gut piles, which is done through voluntary efforts in Arizona for condors. Uh, those sorts of things could be put into place more to reduce that subsidy for, for these birds where it's an issue, because those subsidies also, if they're shot with lead-free ammunition, provide resources for other scavengers that's important today. Um, but we could also do things with uh, keeping them out of our uh, garbage, out of our um, water treatment plants much more effectively. And, and, and that would go a long way. We can keep the road kills uh, less available. And that's done in Montana to, to a good effect. 7,000 or more carcasses have been removed from Montana highways because there's a system where if you uh, find a road kill, you can get a permit online to keep it and eat it. Um, so there are strategies that are being done around the West that could help reduce these subsidies, and that would be a more sustainable way to control the population of ravens. Rather than just shooting them a, a few at a time or, or shooting ones that we have no idea where they're coming from or what they're doing, um, as you've seen with ours, if we were to control ravens at the, at the um, resources in Gardner, we would be affecting raven populations deep in the park and other places where we wouldn't want to have that effect. So um, we're starting to learn maybe how to uh, be more um, appropriate stewards of the land by following what ravens are telling us is wrong with the land, where we're subsidizing it too much, I believe. And I hope we can learn from them rather than just um, take our ire out on the messenger in this case. So with that, I would welcome your uh, input. If you're interested in the work I presented, you can go to my uh, lab site and get reprints and things there, Avian Conservation Lab at the University of Washington. If you wanna track our birds, uh, they are on Animal Tracker. It's a free app from um, Matthias's organization, the Max Planck uh, Institute. And it's a cool way to see where the birds are in real time. And, and it's a good citizen science uh, uh, interface, as is an app we have called Crow Scientists, which is mainly geared at crow behavior, but it has a lot of relevant uh, behavior about ravens as well. And that's another free app that kids could use to get more engaged with, uh, with the natural world. So with that, I would, I would thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to stop my sharing so I can see you guys more. And again, glad to um, answer any questions you might have. Thanks again, John, for uh, joining us. That was a really awesome talk. It still always amazes me uh, seeing those incredible movements and behaviors from uh, the ravens. So uh, we do have some questions in the chat. It looks like we have about 10 minutes. Uh, so maybe I'll start and open it up to any brave souls that maybe want to unmute. Uh, give them 10, 15 seconds, and then I'll, I'll head to the chat. Um. Uh, I guess I have one just brief question. Um, I'm curious how you would think that, like, let's say Bernie, for instance, had a mating partner and then uh, their mating partner was killed. Would you expect that their range would change significantly in that event? Or, you know, what are some of the possibilities to explain that? Yeah, that could very well be what happened. It could also be that, because uh, when we caught him, there was a, another bird with him that we thought we assumed was his mate. Uh, but it, they also form these associations as non-breeders, and it may have simply been that, and may have been something that um, still they're traveling together, but but haven't gotten a territory yet. We have had a, a, uh, eight of our birds die, and one of those we had both members of the pair tagged, and and the male died, and the female stayed right there, and attracted a new mate to that site, uh, and then unfortunately she died the next year or later in that year from there. So uh, I don't know what will happen this year at that site, but 
I'm, I'm anxious to see it. So I think either of those possibilities could be the case um, where they've lost a mate or they had one that didn't have a territory yet. Um, I have a quick question, kind of related. Um, so I study urban coyotes in the Twin Cities area. I do, um, I visit core areas of their home ranges in the summers. And one of the things that I've noticed is the easiest way to locate coyotes that you don't have a light of sight, line of sight on is by finding corvids that are antagonizing them. Mm -hmm. And from what you presented, that seems like kind of a conflict of interest because it seems to me like corvids would benefit from not drawing attention to canines that they could possibly scavenge from. So I was wondering, like, what are the theories on why that's a beneficial behavior for corvids? Well, some of it could be related to moving a potential predator out of the area or making others known, uh, make it known to the predator that, that, that the game's up. They know you're there. You're not going to surprise us. So, so just move on. Corvids do that with all kinds of predators from um, carnivores, uh, mammalian carnivores to owls and hawks and eagles as well. So it, it could probably just be that, but it could also be that they're trying to steal food from them. And it, it also helps to bring in more than, than one or two individuals if you're trying to steal food from a coyote so that as some distracted in the front, others can sneak around and grab the food. They're legendary at doing that. Uh, a pair of ravens will work a sled dog till it's, it, it's lost all of its food and just chasing its tail all day. So um, they're good at, at teamwork when it comes to that kind of selfish teamwork for the most part, but still effective. Cool observation, so. So maybe I'll uh, go to the chat now. So it looks like we have uh, two questions from Dr. Cuthbert. Uh, what's the uh, backstory on your first slide? Uh, do you know who the artist is? And then what's the time period between locations for uh, Raven GPS points? Great. Um, so the time between locations, uh, it's variable, but it's, it's default, it's 30 minutes. But we can adjust it you know, on the fly. And we've done some every um, less than every minute just to see that trajectory, that, that bird that uh, commuted from Mud Volcano, we have a time series uh, for one day every five minutes just to see its flight path. Uh, as it as it made that long commute. And the pictures hanging on the wall right behind me here uh, that I used there, it's by Yvonne Zerbitz, who is a great artist in Ketchikan. And it's a line of cut that Yvonne did um, of uh, ravens and, and a wolf up there. I couldn't hear you, Francie. Oh, yeah, that you answered my questions. OK. Uh, so we have another question from uh, Dr. Bump. For the birds that were regular visitors of carcasses or associated at dens or gut piles, uh, were they highly related? Uh, we don't know of that. We do have blood samples. And uh, that's a question we're, we want to pursue. I doubt it, and I say that from our work in Maine, where uh, they were not related at all, uh, especially these non-vagrant birds, or these vagrant birds, I should say. Um, they are a random collection, it seems, and it's changing. It's not like it's a tight flock by any means, but it's, it's a random aggregation, and it, it just comes and goes throughout the days uh, at a carcass where animals will be there, like we saw those non-breeders, one came in, you know, on day four, the other was there day two, wasn't there afterwards. And there's a lot of flux. And so there doesn't seem to be a lot of pressure for these to be related uh, individual sharing information or other um, sorts of uh, more altruistic activity between relatives. But good question and we definitely wanna look at it. So I also had a question kind of related to some dense sites being visited by ravens and some carcasses being visited more so. I imagine some of that has to do with the landscape. 
Um, but have you looked at correlations between like wolf pack size and how much ravens are utilizing uh, those carcass resources or den sites? No, but it's got to be part of the of the deal, right? You know, if you've got a big pack, there's just not much food left after they're done. Yeah. Uh, for the ravens to even get at. So I, I think that would be excellent to look at. And maybe as the years move on and we get more vari variation in pack size, because because as you know, I mean, the packs that are there during this study, for the most part, are big. Um, yeah. But but we could definitely look at that. And as long as we have the same a variety of pack where most of our birds are, I think we could we could take a valid look at that. If it's just that small packs are where we don't have any birds, then we don't want to be, you know, fooled by that relationship. But it's got to yeah. be part of it. Yeah. And then uh, David Wolfson asks, um, is there any speculation why the Ravens didn't use uh, coyote kill sites? Yeah. Um, I think the, the main thing would simply be when Dan was doing that work, um, that most of the prey that the, the coyotes uh, were getting was small. And so again, they're, you know, they'll catch a, a vole and, and wolf it down or coyote it down <laughs> real quick. So there's not as much. And they do associate with coyotes regularly at kills of wolves. I mean, they're there together. There's their competitors. So um, I think there's less provision by a by a coyote than a wolf for, for the raven's perspective. Now, when there were packs of coyotes and not wolves there, that would have been interesting to see before wolves, how much of that interaction was there. And I bet there was more uh, than there is uh, with wolves on the scene. And then it looks like we have uh, one question from uh, Nancy Gibson. Have there been any studies on the effects of lead poisoning? Yes, there have been a lot of uh, use of ravens kind of as a surrogate for other, um, you know, less, uh, more rare uh, species of birds for lead poisoning and their, their lead levels go up dramatically during the hunting season. We, we can see why they're all up there eating uh, gut piles that most of which are shot with lead uh, ammunition. And um, they've been a good sentinel for that uh, pollution in the environment. Um, we had uh, one of our first birds died after, after that sort of event, and we thought it was uh, related to lead poisoning. Um, but this is something they accumulate throughout their lives, uh, doing this sort of activity, and maybe why ravens have a relatively high mortality rate, higher than crows, for example, where we studied both in another setting, uh, even though they're larger and should live longer by allometry. Well, it looks like we are right at one o'clock. Uh, thanks again, John, for joining us. Really incredible talk. Uh, thanks again, everyone else as well for joining us. Um, look forward to seeing you guys next week uh, for another Conservation Sciences seminar. Thanks a lot, Jack, and thanks everybody.